We're gonna go ahead and get started. If we can get everybody to get in the room, we'll try and get on time here. You don't have to, yeah, on time. You don't have to come up yet. I am, but I gotta speak first. You just wanna sit right there? I don't want you to have to sit on stage. <coughs> Hey, Willis, Tom, <laughs> you can be on this man, but wait till we're, we'll just wait there with Carter. The people on the first panel, I'll uh, speak for a few minutes, just a couple minutes, and then we'll come on up. I didn't want you to have to sit up here and just be stared at, so we'll wait a couple minutes. I think we're about ready to roll. Two long nights. Got to stay, had to stay up late again last night. People were holding court down there at the uh, at the bar, so had to listen to a lot of good stories. Um, appreciate everyone again. Looks like decent weather on the way out, so try and stay on time tonight, today for everyone's flights, and we'll get this thing rolling. Um, thinking differently again. I usually open the first couple sessions just things I've learned or working on since this session. When we switched to FarmCon, we wanted to make it some business acumen, meaning I and many of the people in this room are invested in many businesses, ag businesses, family ag businesses, different things. And I always felt like when I was younger, I didn't get a chance to be around a lot of people that taught me a lot about business. Then I got lucky, met a lot of great people. First panel will be full of great people invest and know about businesses. And there's a few hacks along the way, you know, you can come across and learn. So this last year, or I should say in the last few months, I'm gonna present a few things I've been focusing on. In your business, you have to decide, do you have a product, do you have something that needs to be bought or does it need to be sold? And this goes with a lot of my, I'm on a lot of different boards. And so we have conversations at different companies. And you can think in your head, what's something that needs to be bought or sold? What am I talking about? Car insurance is bought. Life insurance is sold. You guys know, you kind of see what I'm saying. It's kind of like that when we had that microbial thing and they were battle royaling up here on stage. Uh, microbial's got to be sold. You see what I'm saying? Fertilizer, you know, probably nitrogen is going to be bought. So you have to have a different game plan. Your business has to have a different game plan. And you have to decide what your business is. Is something needs to be bought, something needs to be sold. And it's an entirely different approach. If your product's bought, they got to be able to find you. You have to pay up to have location, location, location. I don't care what's on the internet or if it's in retail brick and mortar. You got to pay up. If the product is sold, you gotta be able to find them. And you better be really good at finding them. And you better know your market, product market fit, and your target. And we see a lot of businesses fail on that. A lot of startups fail. Um, know if your team, if it's sales versus marketing strategy. This one I didn't learn until later in life. Does your sales team serve your marketing? Or does your marketing serve your sales team? I'm gonna make it where you, I, you know, I hear people say these things. I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? Nike, this is perfume sales. Perfume sales is your sales team serving your marketing. You go to the counter, you see the ladies there, but Chanel or the different perfume brands have spent a fortune to get to that point. That's Nike. If you go to the other side, you know, Provides and generates leads for salesmen. That's going to be your key. That will be your key driving force. If your marketing is serving your sales team. And you better be good at it. And again, this is just looking at your businesses and trying to break them down like you do on the farming. You know, and looking like Grant was talking about. You know, looking for those specifics. But this is now with business related. Think differently about building a team. So we're gonna build out Ag Swag, and we made the commitment this year, we're gonna start adding a lot of employees. 
to build a team. I heard a guy talk, we were at a board meeting, and he started referencing a lot like this. So we're gonna build out an offensive side. I'm not sure what keeps happening here on the screens. You guys gonna get that fixed back there? There we go. We'll build out an offensive side, so we're gonna hire an offensive coordinator. Basically, the offensive side is gonna score points. They generate, that's our sales team. They're gonna have to score runs. It's gonna be critically important on that side of the ball. We also hire a defensive coordinator. The way we look at defense though, and everyone will look at it a little different with their business, how do you reduce risk? The defense coordinator is charged reducing risk, reducing cost. We're gonna have a team that just focuses on buying better. So we may buy 50,000 hats in bulk at one clip, a certain style, reduce our cost, stay on top of it more. Uh, that's gonna be our defensive coordinators, uh, our defensive team. Logistically more savvy on our shipping and freight. And then we're gonna have a creative coordinator. Our creative coordinator's in charge of our art department, our social media department, things like that. So that'd be your special teams coach, right? That's the way we're looking at building this business out. So we'll have an offensive coordinator, defense, and then uh, the creative side of the ball. So. We like it because we can understand it, Jordan and I, some of the other sports guys that we've hired on the team. So it's easy for us to put people or players in a position we can kind of figure out. So I wanted to pass it along because we found it helpful. You can do it, you can do it on the farm as well, the same way. Um, pay close attention to time. This is where it gets crazy. Offense is going to be external meetings. You're out there making things happen. Defense, internal meetings. We go to a lot of ag startups, there's a lot of time being spent on internal. A lot of time being spent on the defensive side of the ball, which is, that's where it's easy to gravitate towards. It's easy to get pulled that direction. The best people, the, some of the best early investors I've met want to focus and they spend a lot of time seeing if a company's spending 70, 80% of the time on offense. And they like that formula. If they're spending 50-50, eh, some really early stage investors I know don't like it. It's hard for a CEO to break that, break that mold a little bit. So you got to pay close attention to the time and where you're spending the time, just like going to practice. So when I worked for the NFL, we'd go out uh, to the big, big colleges. They had it down to science. I mean, you know, you go to a little league practice, there's one kid tackling one kid and 20 standing in line. You go to a high, high, high college or an NFL, each player is, each coach is being filmed from the bird's nest. You guys know it. They film each coach. And your players all have to be moving and all have to be getting reps. And they want to see X number of reps per minute. And they review the, get the practice films. And if you're not getting your players X number of reps per minute, you kind of get your ass busted. And that's how it was back in the 90s even. And I know now it's even worse. So you got to pay close attention to time and how much time you're spent allowing your team to be on the offensive side of the ball, score points. So I think it's critically important. Hire like your life depends on it. You got to be recruiting all the time. I heard some people talk, some of the best founders uh, spend about a third of their time recruiting. I'm horrible at it. I just am not that good at it. You got to get people super excited about your business or your you know, your family business, you got to tell them your story. Then you got to be looking for new talent and you got to continually upgrade the talent. And that's what has to happen. And your best founders are really good at it. And we have plenty in this room that are really good at it. So I think you have to pay close attention. An easy way on the fire that I've gone to, you know, you got to be able to discard. Would you want a thousand more of that person? Yeah, go ahead, laugh. <laughs> Would you, you guys all know, you, you know, you got people on your staff. Well, it's easy. Do you want a thousand more of that person? No. Okay, you're going to have to get rid of them. You're going to have to bite the bullet and take the tough steps. And it, it gets pretty easy when you start to play it out that way. And if you can't make those hard decisions, you better put someone in your place as CEO that can. And or you're, you're in trouble. So you got you to be able to call the shots. And... As times are getting tough, and I believe a very short runway for many businesses right now, money has alternatives. You're gonna start seeing people on the chopping block. 
I've had many calls in the last two days, two days of several ag businesses I know of closing and shutting their doors or laying off a lot of people. So I think money's tight. The runways are going to be short. I'm excited for the first panel to come up. If you guys want to come on up, we'll get started and dive in. They're all going to be, you know, ag business related, have lots of uh, money invested on the ag business side. I'm going to try and drill them with some tough questions. Aha, Mr. Chris. <laughs> Tom, appreciate it. Yep, so we'll get this started. Here comes Soren. I didn't know what walk-up song you guys wanted. Caught on. So I we left it caught kinda... <laughs> right. We should have caught him. Hey, buddy. Mr. Willis, you want to start off with you? Yeah. I haven't sat down yet. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Might as well shut that one off. All right. <clears throat> We're going to start off with Tom. He's filling in. Um, Tom was supposed to be on panel yesterday, but he fell asleep and he missed that one. I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding Tom. He, he, well, I tried to have him up yesterday, but we, we miscommunicated. So Steve missed his flight. Mr. Barr, uh, he didn't miss his flight. He had flight complications out of Tampa with Southwest. So Steve wasn't able to make it, but Tom, I asked Tom last night if he would fill in and kind of Tom spends a lot of time and around a lot of people in Washington, and uh, there's a few things going on that Tom just wanted to brief the audience on. If you want more details, hit Tom up today, and uh, he can go into a few more things. But Tom, tell us what your thoughts are on, on where things are headed here. All right. This on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, before I get started on that, real briefly, Building off what Kevin said, if there's been a lot of good ideas that have been talked about yesterday, a lot of discussion, more today. But there's one thing if you don't take away from this conference, if you don't take away from it, it's a big mess. And Kevin, I want to go back to 12 years ago when this started, and there was 120 of us, and we had daylight donuts, and your wife and your sister busted their ass trying to serve barbecue. <laughs> And the one speaker was Kevin. We listened to Kevin for six hours. That was hell. It was hell that day. <laughs> Look what it's become today. And my point behind that, and, and Jordan, I don't think Jordan was even out of high school, was he? No, no, huh? No. Nope. Today, young man's running a $4 million, if I heard correctly, $4 million business. Why? Why the size of the room this way? Because... Kevin and his family, or all of us, served a customer. They did it in a way that provided a need for all of us. Well, all of us are here for separate reasons, different reasons. But they provided that outlet through a service. Did they want to get paid and make some money? Sure, we all do. But if you don't take away from the fact that in business, there's too many people that think it needs to be a win-lose, that you're, uh, to me anyway, you're missing the big point. And Kevin, I, I want to applaud what you guys have done. It's, I appreciate it, Tom, amazing. for sure. Amazing. So, real quickly, in the renewable space, there's a couple of things that I, I wanted to bring to everybody's attention. Um, now, many of you that don't know me, I kind of keep my political views close to my vest. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> it's, it's really hard to know where I stand on on politics, but this recent um, Inflation Reduction Act, probably one of the things that you have in common with, with Congress is that neither one of you have read it, okay? But there are some key things here for agriculture that I, that I, I wanted to just take a second and go, go through with you. It's the largest piece of climate uh, legislation that's ever come through the, the the pike. Number two, the view of carbon capture. 12 years ago, I was, or 10 years ago, I was with EPA, and we were trying to get a, a pathway, uh, get a D5 rent. I don't want to get too much inside baseball. And I said, California is going to allow us for sequestering CO2 uh, to count 
that towards our pathway into California on our ethanol. Before I got back to liberal Kansas, EPA had called California and said, what in the world are you doing? If you give Conestoga a pathway to be able to sequester CO2, you're going to give a lifeline to coal. And our goal is to kill the coal industry. 180 degrees on that today. Sequestering CO2 is vogue. I will tell you why I'm here in just a second, why it impacts you. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, and again, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it doesn't have to, fertilizer production, 1% um, of the global emissions in the world. There is going to be a push, I don't know how economic it is, through this incentive, uh, inflation incentive bill to produce more fertilizer out of hydrogen and less using natural gas. It's going to be expensive, but in this bill, there's quite a bit of money that they're willing to throw to try to convert from natural gas-based urea uh, or nitrogen. It actually would be anhydrous ammonia is what it would create to a, to a, a green-based um, fertilizer. Second of all, the RFS that came out, proposals that are out there, for the first time has higher than 15 billion gallons of conventional blending. That's over 10% of the forecasted gasoline. I know yesterday one of the, uh, the panelists said ethanol is here to stay. I do want to go on the record that for 12 years, despite being beaten around the head about it, I've been consistent that it, it is. It's a part of our fuel supply. The one thing that's changed that's going to impact you guys, take away from it, many of the states are opting out of the RVO waiver. That is something that kept us from going to E15. Many of the states, the corn states, farm states, uh, have opted out. Why is that important to you? It means that if they have a gasoline blend that they're making and one of it's E10, one of it's E15, this state's in, this state's out, they have to make two different types of gasoline. They don't want to do that. So what are we seeing for the first time? We're seeing some of the major blenders and refiners that are coming and saying, you know what, E15 is not such a bad idea. It's not that necessarily that they change their opinion, it's just that they don't want to have to make another grade of gasoline. Why is that good for us? If you're in production agriculture, that's additional use for corn and, and, and sorghum on that side of things. Um, still don't know how the uh, electronic grains are going to be handled, but for California, and Washington and Oregon, Canada, for them to hit their, uh, their goals that they have in terms of decarbonization, ethanol is going to have to carry the, the ball. Renewable diesel will be there. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind on that, you're looking at about a 25 or 30 cents a gallon difference between using corn oil to produce it and soy oil to produce it, corn being the advantage. When you produce renewable diesel, when it goes out, you have to tell people what it was made out of. So there's a 30 cent a gallon disadvantage there. A year ago at this meeting, carbon credits in California were 200 bucks a ton. Big incentive to want to build and go. Today, it's worth 65 to $70 a ton. Something to keep an eye on. You got to watch that because these programs only work if they're incentivized by the government. That's the reality of it. <clears throat> um, lastly, and I think the thing that provides the biggest opportunity from an ethanol perspective, there is more money being thrown out there to sequester carbon to get a low, lower CI score. And I mean, when you look at what the government is willing to put out there, for the first time, uh, we are going to be judged and paid on the carbon intensity of our alcohol, of our ethanol, okay? And I will have the tools, or the ethanol industry will have the tools, if they can participate in this program, to come to you as producers and say, here's a list of things that will lower the carbon intensity of my alcohol. 40% of the overall footprint in producing ethanol is at the farm gate. The amount of money that is out there will allow us to be able to come back to you as producers, what I would say for the first time, really, 
and say, hey, if you will adopt this whole list, part of the list, this, this, there'll be incentives out there. And it's big money, and it's not going away. And that, to me, is a huge game changer out there. It's a huge game changer. So for those of you that are invested in ethanol plants, for those of you that sell, uh, you might want to see what they're doing in terms of their decarbonization program because there's real dollars, and I don't want to make it sound like we're greedy, but, obviously, you know, after I give the big speech about Kevin and win-win and all that <laughs> stuff, but we're going to be forced as an industry to share that with you. Not that we wouldn't do it begrudgingly, but we would. We're going to be forced to share that with you because of the economic incentives that the government's giving us. <clears throat> Don't forget that, because that's, that's absolutely a, uh, a, a huge thing that's, uh, that's in, that, uh, in that bill. So um, with that, I would leave this. Ethanol's here. Uh, if you look at it, there's going to be some consolidation. There's no question about that. If you're invested in plants, my question would be at your annual meeting, what are you doing to diversify? Are you going down hole with your carbon? Uh, are you fractionating uh, the distillers to make a higher protein feed? But the companies that are going to be here in the future in this space are going to be the ones that are diversifying and taking advantage of the many programs out there for sustainability. I'll end with this just to show you how important the farm gate is. We have a customer in another country that we ship probably 50 million or 60 million gallons of ethanol to a year that has come back to us already and said in 2024, be ready because we want to have a pin on a map of every producer that brings you buy corn from that comes up to us. Now you look at it and you say, well, gee whiz, that's kind of undaunting. But they're willing to pay me for it. So, again, I have no choice because I'm not going to lose that market. But that's what they want. They want a pin on a map of every farmer that's supplying us. You might not agree with it, but it's there. The opportunity for the farmer to be able to capture part of this value has never been greater than it is now. And I think, remember, Tom has farms, runs cattle. I mean, he's on the same page, correct, Tom? I mean, you're seeing yeah. it out in your area, out in southwest Kansas. So, so yeah. that, that's it, Kevin. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Let's, let's jump to Chris. Uh, Chris, I think that leads right in perfectly with uh, what you're seeing. Yeah, and lead, you can kind of tell us some more detail. Um, I think a lot of you know Chris with Indigo and they're making some big moves into the space. So tell us where we're at on that. Yeah, leads in real well. <clears throat> you know, one of the things to just think about, there are kind of three big bucket areas of carbon, just to make sure everyone's clear on it. There's the compliance market, there's the voluntary market, and then there's um, what we talk about, the injection wells that's on the backside of ethanol production. And I get a lot of questions and confusion about pipelines of carbon. Is that the same thing you're doing with Indigo? They're, they're different. So our approach in, in what we're doing with the voluntary carbon market is using soil carbon, your soils, slight changes in practices. And we're talking about um, altering fertilizer application times, types, the things you're already doing. Um, there's an opportunity for you to make more revenue off of off of those carbon programs in conjunction with what you're already doing. Now there's a lot of government money and programs out there right now. One of the, one of the warnings or things to think about there is if you are about to go into one of those programs, make sure you're in a carbon program in that same year that you start. It's critical. Otherwise you use up your eligibility and you miss out on the carbon programs. Those carbon programs, the voluntary programs, things like Indigo pay out over 10 years. But if you go in and Say so you've never done a cover crop, you're going to add a cover crop this year because there's government dollars there for you. Go get the government dollars, absolutely. But make sure you're also in a carbon program where you're leaving that carbon dollars on the table over the next 10 years. And the price of credits is going up. We've seen an increase. We started, we hit the market in 2019 with $20 a ton. We raised it to 27 and we worked directly with the buyers. Now there's a demand that's enormous 
right? You're not in competition with your neighbor. There is five times the demand for what U.S. agriculture could produce right now, all right? Just think, so let that settle in for a second. It, carbon is a crop that you don't have to deliver. You're not in competition with your neighbor over it. And there's a demand that's much larger than you can possibly supply. All right, so there's an opportunity for everyone in it. We started at 20, raised the price to 27, raised the price to 40, raised the price even higher than that now in the discussions we're having. Look at Bloomberg, other sources, they're talking about 150 to $200 a ton for voluntary carbon. What I mean by voluntary is these are companies, Fortune 500 companies who we're working with, who have voluntarily told the public through their boards and through announcements that they were going to achieve a net zero target where they were going to try to remove all the carbon from their supply chain. Now they do this in three ways. So this terminology is like carbon intensity and all these new terms for us all, but there's scope one, scope two, and scope three. And you might hear those terms. And really what matters for scope one and two is they're just getting renewable electricity. They're beating out of their system. You know, it's why I can go get a propane powered forklift for my farm easy now because they're all battery in the factories, right? They're, they're doing everything they can to reduce the carbon footprint of the products they produce. What they can't control is the scope three. Scope three is the materials and the ingredients that are coming in from all of you, right? That's the corn, the soy, the ingredients that are coming into food products or into industrial, industrial products as ingredients. They're going to look to you just like in the fuel space. They're going to look to you to reduce the carbon intensity, the carbon footprint of that product that you're producing, and they're going to pay you for it. That comes out as a carbon credit, is really just being sold to someone who ordinarily doesn't buy that material that you produce. Think of an airline, all right? They're selling airline tickets. They're burning jet fuel. There's no replacement for a jet right now. There's no electric jets. There's nothing on the horizon even that could replace that form. So they're going to continue to burn either fossil fuels or renewable, sustainable aviation fuels coming into the mix. These are the opportunities, but they have to buy from you a carbon credit, and they're monetizing that. That's what $35, $40 a ton is. On the other side of it, if you're in the, in the supply chain and you've been like a Kellogg's or an Anheuser-Busch or a group who's already buying agricultural products, they're looking to reduce the footprint of that in scope three coming into their operations. So we're able to uh, work with them as well. And all of this requires two things from you. It requires you to make some type of change on your farm and document it. That's what has to happen in the first year. But that's only half of the value. The other half of the value comes from that change sticking around. If that change is undone in that year or in the next year, you end up in a situation where um, its value decreases dramatically and then the value that you would be paid uh, decreases dra dramatically. So there's, there's this need to come in and make the change, stick with the change, stick with a program, but it's the record keeping piece that is a big part of the software and other things that we're all working on is how do you have the pin on the map to know where your farm is? How do you know what was produced where and what went into it to show those buyers that it had a reduced footprint? If it does, there's more dollars in it for you. So all these things can be summed up as financial opportunities for the farm. And I'm not selling you a carbon program. I'm asking you to produce carbon for us. We found the buyers. There's more than enough, and their price is going up. Figure out how to be good at carbon farming one way or the other, whether it's a compliance market, a voluntary market, or whether you're, um, as an operator of an ethanol facility, thinking about shoving it in the pipeline and injecting it deep. All those are good for the atmosphere. Right? The whole goal here is society has said we're going to decrease the loading of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. This is the way we do it, and this is the way agriculture can do it. And that's our, our fit. Where, where Indigo plays in this is where that scientific group in the middle that proves that this invisible gas of carbon is pulled out of the atmosphere with plants and with the, uh, the wonderful photosynthesis that happens in agriculture. It's pulled out of the air. It's shoved into the ground. We're proving that that actually happens to buyers so that you can get compensated the max possible. We share in that economics, so we're looking to make sure it's as um, beneficial to you as possible. Right? So we're looking to help you capture the most carbon per acre possible, whether that's actually through the practice changes, the different things you're doing, 
or whether it's the quality of the science and the scale of our program that allows us to reduce all the uh, uncertainties and things around that that help you get paid the most. That's where this all fits together for me, and um, thanks for having me. Kevin. Yeah, I appreciate it, Chris. I know we all have a ton of questions. I've got more questions than answers on the carbon side always, it seems like. So Chris will be around, won't you, Chris, if they've got questions? Yeah, absolutely. For, absolutely. For you specifically. Uh, Mary, Shellman, let's talk about what we're seeing, consumer trends and changes that you're seeing. Remember, Mary, had a far she has a farm in uh, Kentucky. Nice new uh, cabin up in uh, Smoky Mountains, I hear, and spending a bunch of time up there. And so I always love hearing Mary's perspective. And you guys know she was at Harvard uh, running their agribusiness program. So tell us some things you're seeing, Mary. Thanks, Kevin. And yeah, my the, the new house is actually up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, which has been warmer than some of the, the mountains in Kentucky. So, uh, you know, kind of brings us back to some of the things we've been saying. So basically for the last, you know, 10, 12 years, I've been talking about four big trends that have been driving change. Top of that list are consumers. They're, you know, engaged now in what they're doing. They're empowered in these decisions. We see this rise of as you, you all have heard, you know, these values-based decision-making, um, you know, you look at the rise of products, cage-free eggs, organic fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, non-GMO, and while, you know, some of us, so I have the, you know, kind of the, I won't call it the pleasure, but the opportunity to live in Boston, but yet, you know, keep a lot of my um, connections back with the Midwest. And to try to translate the you know, actions into, into maybe a more um, practical kind of environment it is often hard, but, um, but, it, but it's here and it's around. And I guess one of the things that, that really, um, you know, that consumer base today as we're seeing it is that, you know, it was, I think a lot of it started out, you know, concerns about health, so organic, you know, drivers with health, concerned about the environment. But today that kind of what's on top of my mind so 70% of young people in the world, like 17 to 25, suffer from something called eco-anxiety. They're so concerned about climate change and, you know, that the, the world is going to be, like, in a horrible situation in the future, that they're suffering from mental health issues, um, they're depressed, they're um, anxious, and they just don't see any positive future for the world, you know, this is causing changes in actions. You know, one in four of them are saying they're not going to have kids because they don't want to bring children into this world that's going to be in a terrible shape. Um, and that drives back, of course, into, into buying decisions. So we can say, oh, yeah, these values-based, you know, decisions. You know, we've got this inflationary environment now. Folks are going to pull back from that because, you know, they're not going to have, you know, jobs or as much income. But this is really a fundamental change that's going on over time. And I think it's here to stay for sure. Kind of leads into that second big trend, which is around sustainability, how, you know, over the past 10 or 12 years, that's something that's gone from what was a fad to something that's very, very fundamental now to doing business. So, you know, like indigo, ethanol, um, all of the, these opportunities, you know, these corporates are making these big, big, big commitments in this space, um, these ESG kind of commitments. They don't know how they're gonna get there because 70% in terms of food products, you know, of the impact is actually in your control, not in their control. And so that's leading to some, some you know, some very creative um, opportunities, tensions, but again, not, not going away, probably getting um, even, you know, greater around that to satisfy the consumers that are out there, but also to, um, you know, to satisfy the investor community and the lender community, which is looking at this as potentially a food security issue as well. And then kind of the enablers driving change in this space are on the tech and the investment side. So we see these transformational technologies all across the supply chain. I know they come knocking at your doors every single day. I had a conversation yesterday morning, you know, how do you actually decide, you know, what you're going to try, what you're going to do. It's like, well, you know, we really don't know. This is uh, tough. You know, do we like this person? Do we trust them? Are they authentic? Is there, is there data? Um, and then, but they, yet you look on beyond that and the investments that have been basically flowing into this space like a fire hose, um, trying to, you know, saying, hey, there's an opportunity here. There's some challenges. We think that we can drive change, you know, faster. That might be drying up some now um, as, 
their money alternatives look differently. But, um, but so we look at kind of four different pathways that we've identified moving towards a more sustainable food system, which is something that we would all say that we need, given that we have finite resources and that we will have growing demand. The first one is what we heard a lot about yesterday. We have to do more with less. So basically, let's keep doing the same thing, let's, you know, but we're just going to do it better and better. And we call that, you know, defend. Like what we're doing is, is great. We know we made great progress over the years, and we're going to take that forward. And then there's a group of companies out there that are actually saying, hey, wait a minute, consumers, there's this group of consumers that are willing to pay more for something. Let's develop products that are very specific for them. So, you know, maybe some of you grow organic, some of you, you know, handle non-GMOs on your farm, some do specialty crops. So that's a, you know, we're going to do a little bit more and we're going to differentiate and be able to charge a little bit more for that probably. But then we have these two other camps that are out there. And one um, we call Defy, and that's basically the folks that want to change what people eat. So no longer, you know, is it about, you know, you should, shouldn't consume, you know, beef, you should consume less dairy. All of these things have big impacts. And so you see the rise of the plant-based proteins um, and, uh, you know, insects, uh, you know, different kinds of, peas, you know, things that, that you know, to, to get folks to do. And um, you see some success in this space. I know that a lot of it right now, you know, you see the um, results from, you know, companies like Impossible and Beyond with their plant-based burgers. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is dead, right? It's going away. I don't think that's where the battle's going to be played out. If you look at some of the food service companies in the U.S., they have their own objectives to increase the um, – or actually to reduce the amount of meals that they serve with an animal protein in it. And so those targets, you know, up now there's like, yeah, we, you know, we're up to 11% of meals that we serve that don't have plant, you know, that don't have animal protein in it. We want to take that up to 15. We want to take that up to 20. So this battle's not being played out at the retail, you know, at your supermarket, whether you choose to buy a, you know, a beef hamburger or a Beyond Burger. It's being played out in, you know, hospitals and schools and your food service, you know, institutions that, that get served there. So don't count those out yet. Fourth area that, you know, we, we kind of starting to hear a lot about are ones that are more disruptive approaches. So cultivated meats, uh, precision fermentation to produce dairy proteins and other proteins that are there. You might think, well, that's kind of crazy, but if you go to Singapore now, you can buy cultivated chicken on the market or in, in a, a convenience store in restaurants. It's approved. It's on the menu. You see tremendous investments going in that. I think that's a long way out. But if you go to the supermarket in my hometown in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, you can buy in the, um, the ice cream section a product called Brave Robot. And it is, tastes just like Haagen-Dazs, but it's an animal-free product. There is a, um, a, a way in there that is produced through precision fermentation that is genetically equivalent to whey from animals. And so these products are there. You may not even notice, but they are drop-in replacements for this. Um, so these products are coming. They're not that far away. There's still some cost issues to work out. There's certainly a lot of capital issues in terms of scaling up that production. But they're, they're out there and they are moving around. So what does this mean for you? You know, the things that I think you need to be kind of watching out for in this. First of all, I completely agree with what everybody's saying. Data is valuable. So it's probably the most valuable thing that you can produce on your farm. And data is going to be what allows you to participate in these sustainability programs to sell carbon credits. I happen to be a little skeptical about that. But, um, it's, um, but that's what's going to, like, make you a partner to these corporates that need to be able to, to re meet their ESG commitments or to supply, you know, low uh, carbon, decarbonized, you know, ethanol change. Um, don't count out these plant-based meats yet. Just as a reminder, plant-based dairy right now, so plant-based milk, so 14% of the U.S. milk market, um, consumed by 40% of U.S. households. So these things can get in. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's this flexitarian approach. Um, the 
the interesting thing, that, though, about these products, like these, you know, making a specific dairy protein or a specific cut of meat, it changes the economics of the entire industry. So if you think about, you know, a beef carcass, if you pull out one piece of that carcass, the economics of the animal can collapse. So, you know, kind of keep your eye on that. The same thing with dairy. You pull out a valuable dairy component out of milk. What is, happens to the rest of those products that are in there? Um, watch out for what governments around the world, particularly in Asia, are doing. Singapore has a, pro a program called 30 by 30. They want to be produce 30% of their own food by 2030. And they're an island. They have no land base. So how do you do that? You do things like aquaculture. You do things like cultivated meat and alternative proteins. You do things like indoor farming. Um, this is driven by food security concerns, but there's lots of investment in technology that's going on there that will have a spillover effect um, around that. So you know, watch where those government supports are. Um, my biggest concern in the space um, that what keeps me up at night long term is um, licensed operate. And going, kind of wrapping back to those young consumers that are, you know, you know, keep, wake, keep themselves up at night because they suffer from eco-anxiety. They are our consumers of tomorrow. They are our voters now. They are, you know, increasingly are, you know, moving into positions of decision making, influence. Um, they have energy, they have, you know, don't know about, you know, beating their heads against the wall. They're the ones that are out there. And um, you look at what's happening now around the world, you know, the Netherlands is basically getting out of the pork industry. Um, Ireland, New Zealand, two countries that are excellent at producing milk with a very low footprint are actually having to cut herd sizes because of their footprint, yet their, you know, that their consumer pressure inside, even though most of their milk is exported. So, um, you know, that's why you have to pay attention to this space. No, I agree totally. I, I, think, I think a lot of folks are maybe the word sustainable is kind of starting to wear on people. I was on a call the other day, and the guy said, big farmer, he said, I'm telling you now, if it's not profitable, it ain't sustainable on this farm. So I think they might be <laughs> right. I mean, you probably, it's going to have to be profitable to be sustainable longer term. So yeah. I, it's interesting, and I think like Mary's saying, watch some of these other countries as they make shifts and changes because that's going to spill over, and those technologies will become available. And who knows how that runs uh, runs wild? So I appreciate that, Mary. Soren, let's uh, let's chat. Soren, it's on. I know a few different boards uh, now, and he's had some time uh, in the past few years to invest and look at different landscapes. As you know, Soren was uh, former CEO at Bungie, so kind of gotten to I guess explore a little bit more and see what's happening out there in agriculture, and you know maybe not so much uh, from a consumer's perspective, but you know, what's happening with some of the bigger business? Where do you see things shifting to and changing and, and some of the things you're looking at to uh, invest moving forward with some of your projects? Yeah, uh, Kevin, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I, I just keep thinking, uh, you know, we're still in a cyclical business. Uh, and that's the one thing that I know from the 36 years in, in agribusiness is uh, it, it just never stays the same. And as good as things are looking now for me, um, don't forget where we were three years ago. You know, 350 corn and six, six dollar beans. And who would have thought that we would be where we are right now? Uh, so I always think about ways when things are good to prepare for when things don't get so good. Uh, and uh, you know they're coming, you just don't know exactly when. Um, and so I'll come back to that in a, in, in a little bit. But three years ago, low prices, uh, pinched profitability across every sector of agribusiness, really, from, from the farm through crush, refining. I mean, I, I wish I stayed a little longer to enjoy the crush margins we have now. Um, but anyways, uh, it was a different world. Um, fake meat, plant-based protein was taking over the world, uh, and, and, and there was, the sky was, was the limit. And, uh, you know, now, now we see where, where, where we are. So um, I, I, I think it's just interesting to think back where we come from a very, very short period of time and then spend you know, all the great um, opportunities that are in front of you, whether it's as a producer or a consumer or in the middle, uh, to experiment a bit. 
uh, dip, your, dip your toe in the water, whether it's in carbon, whether it's in different farming practices. Uh, there's plenty to pick from, uh, but you obviously have to be disciplined and pick the things that really make a difference to you. But now is the time to try new stuff. Uh, it's not to just keep doing the same old stuff uh, because that will ultimately bite you and it doesn't matter whether you're a big agribusiness company or a or, or, or farming, farming operation. But I would like to digress a little bit, Kevin, if you don't mind, uh, because um, throughout my career what, what always fascinated me the most was the ability of global ag, food and local um, to adjust to change. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you think about what's happening just this last 12 months. And we are, we're now in a, in a fight to fight on a battle to just produce enough food uh, around the world. And we are faced with all these incredible and unprecedented shocks to the system. And we heard of many of those, starting with Peter yesterday, um, geopolitics, a real, real war at our hands in, in the Black Sea. Um, and, and I think Peter sort of painted what I think was a pretty dark scenario that I don't really subscribe to. Um, just a few comments. Um, I think it was mentioned yesterday. Russian wheat has continued to flow uh, despite everything that's going on. It's just going to different places. Uh, Russia and China will figure out what to do with the lack of insurance on tankers. I mean, Costco, not Costco, but Costco is the largest tanker fleet in the world. So the Chinese will figure out a way like how to get that Russian Russian oil into China, the same way that China and Brazil will figure out a way to provide enough fertilizer to Brazil so that they can get all those beans back that they need. And Morocco is emerging as a superpower in phosphate rock production that it's always been, but will probably have a more prominent position uh, in the world. Norway is going to increase its capacity to supply Germany with natural gas. Uh, you know, the war in Ukraine obviously has shifted trade flows around. Uh, you know, a million tons of mostly Ukrainian grain was loaded out of Constanza, Romania, uh, just this past month. So my, my point is that everything adjusts very, very quickly, and that's good to see. Another thing we didn't talk about much uh, yesterday was Argentina, the, you know, what really was a powerhouse uh, in agriculture, and particularly in soybean meal exports. There were honestly the pain in the backside for so many years always undercutting prices and continuing to expand and grow they've really paid for underinvestment in their industry both at the farm level but also at the crushing capacity level over the last five or ten years to the point now where they they become marginal uh, but that won't last forever but for the short term it has played into this sort of good environment everybody's everybody's enjoying uh, at the moment uh, we've had strange weather patterns, they'll continue. We've had volatility in ener energy prices we haven't seen before, fertilizer associated with that, global transport volatility. We heard about ocean, ocean freight yesterday, how volatile it's been, but what sort of shocks me the most is really uh, how volatile it's been in the domestic market in the United States. I mean, I've never seen barge rate move anything like it has this past year, and I heard the replacement price of a barge now uh, is it's doubled what it was in 2016 when I remember we bought the last ones at, at, at Bungie. So, you know, this great river system we have uh, that was really the competitive advantage for the U.S. to export grain around the world, you know, maybe it's not so competitive anymore. And uh, we got to be careful that we don't just think about, you know, the domestic market in the U.S. But the biggest single thing uh, that is sort of rocking the world, I think, uh, at least in the next, next three to five years, is renewable diesel. Uh, you know, I, I, I was sort of skeptical about that piece for a while because I just couldn't see how it would make enough of a difference from an energy security perspective and from, a, from an environmental perspective, but um, I certainly wouldn't bet against it. And you've got both sides of, you know, farm community, the middlemen, the crushers, refiners, and now big oil all on the same side of this. And if if renewable diesel production goes from two to six billion gallons, which is what everybody thinks it will over the next five years or so, well, that's somewhere around 40 million acres of soybeans uh, that we need uh, more of. And that either has to come from corn or it has to come in the form of reduced exports or combination of both. It's just, it's just, absolutely, it's just absolutely amazing. The benefit of this, uh, of course, will, will be hopefully to the U.S. farmer and everybody who participates in the value chain, but it'll also be to places like Brazil. Uh, Brazil is, is clearly going to be the big winner in this. Uh, 
you know, acreage will continue to expand. Investments in Brazilian ag agriculture will continue, infrastructure and so forth, because those, those beans that won't come out of the U.S. or the corn that won't come out of the U.S. will have to come from someplace else. And so Brazil, I think, is likely to be the big winner, winner in this. On top of all this, uh, we've got inflation, we've got interest rates, foreign exchange moves that we haven't seen for a long time uh, happening now on a daily basis, and then all the environmental demands that, that, that we've just talked about. My, my point is this is a soup of highly volatile stuff um, that you all have to navigate through on a daily basis. And I don't, I don't know many people who can put it all together, frankly, and draw a conclusion as well as, as you can, Kevin. I, have to give you that credit, uh, sure. but you're all, I mean, you, you all have to find somebody you trust uh, to help you navigate this. There's, there's just not enough time in the day or enough smart people who can do all this on their own and run, and run a complicated operation on, on, on top of this. Uh, but the point is really that despite all of these incredible headwinds and dislocations and terrible things that are happening around the world, the global trade in agriculture and food and I think you can say the same thing about the U.S. system through the pandemic, is incredibly resilient. I mean, it's unbelievable how quickly things adjust and how fast companies, farmers, adjust to price signals and make things work. Um, I think if you had thrown all this out on a board three years ago or two years, even last year, and said this is going to happen, I think we would have all guessed a different outcome. Uh, the fact is that you know, the system still worked quite well, and, and most people... Uh, have access to reasonably affordable food. In this environment, I think it's uh, pretty, it, it, it sort of, to me, feels like a lot of the underlying trends that had started maybe a few years ago, <coughs> such as different types of food products, whether it's alternative protein, fake meat, call it whatever you want, um, or uh, different types of ingredients, different ways of consuming, uh, and maybe even some of the environmental stuff, it kind of gets drowned out in all this sort of immediate big stuff and big profitability that's, that's in front of us. Um, and so, you know, to me, the, the, the biggest opportunities uh, near term, while all these underlying trends continue, is going to be everything that has to do with, I think it's been said so many times over the last couple of days, producing more or the same with less. So whether it's ultra precision, uh, farming practices, whether it is, you know, much more understanding, deeper understanding of soil health, backed up with data and measurements and biologicals in whatever shape to help accelerate the process to improve soil health that will allow you to take out traditional fertilizers and maybe even pesticides and herbicides and, and still produce a good crop. I mean, that's to me where the big opportunity is. Uh, it, it's, uh, all the other things will, will be important, but they'll take They'll take, they'll take a lot longer to become really meaningful. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I loved the discussion yesterday, the panel that sort of went, went very deep on biologicals, <laughs> but I, you know, and I'm not an expert in it, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that for each farm, there's a, there's a unique mix of practices that's, that suit you, but uh, that's, that's where I would be spending a lot of my time right now. Another thing um, I, I'd say is, is there's got to be, some way of also uh, diversi diversifying income streams um, at the farm by producing some, something slightly different. Uh, so one of the things that, 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 that I thought about in, in light of the renewable diesel and this sort of insatiable demand for vegetable oil is, you know, how can we produce more oil-bearing seeds or oil, or oil seeds that have more oil in them? Uh, and, and soybeans is not necessarily the best choice. If you, if you want to think about it. But, you know, we do have varieties of even corn that have high oil. Uh, Tom Willis, I don't know whether you have a view on this or not, but I remember 20 years ago, uh, maybe even a little bit more, we were growing high oil corn uh, for feed. So, you know, it was corn that had, I think, 6% oil or 7% oil as opposed to 3 And that you could translate into, you know, a feed value uh, that you would then share a lot of the value chain. But I mean, think about the fact that if you can grow corn that has, I don't know, seven, eight, I think I've even heard about corn varieties that could have up to 9% oil in them, and you could squeeze that out in the process. Um, you know, that's a, over the ethanol capacity that's installed and has oil extraction capacity or is coming on, that's a phenomenal amount of 
you know, highly valuable oil uh, that the industry needs. You can say the same thing for soybeans. I mean, why, why, why can't we figure out a way to produce soybeans that have 20% or 21% oil in them, um, even if it is at a slight yield loss? You know, every percentage point is worth 15 bucks a ton, you know, 50 cents a bushel. It's just there's so much money in that. And, I mean, now is the time for, you know, Matt, those who produce the seeds, um, you know, to, to come up with something that's a little different and actually meets what needs what we meets what we need, which is, at least for the next five years, much more oil. Canola, uh, I looked at it the other day. I, I was kind of surprised that almost 2.5 million acres of canola is now grown in the U.S. It's, not, it's a small crop, but it's growing. And, you know, it's, 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 we need more canola, frankly. You know, 40%, 40% oil. The Covercrest story that I know Bungie and Chevron and I think it's Bayer have, have invested in, I don't know how actionable that is in the very near term, but that is exactly what we need more of, uh, a, an in-between crop that actually bears a yield, an oil yield in this case, uh, that can feed this big renewable diesel machine. Um, I think contract growing in general, whether it's high-protein beans for, for Matt or any of the other things I've mentioned, uh, or it could be wheat for General Mills, uh, I think is a great way to dip your toe into something else that has a bit more structure. Um, and, and there's a lot of programs out there. Many of the CPG companies want, want farmers signed up just for them. Um, and you know, many, com many, many companies can facilitate that. Uh, I think it's a great way to diversify income stream and maybe you know, get exposure to what it means to be part of something uh, that you know, is connecting straight to the consumer. So I think that the, the message is just try, try to find ways to diversify experiment a bit, uh, and I think that goes for the carbon as well. I, I was not aware that the price of carbon had gotten to the 40s. I, I was still thinking it was in the mid-teens. Um, it tells you how, how far I'm removed from it. Um, so it, 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 I have no doubt that over the medium term, whether it is farming for carbon or whatever you want to call it, but you know, getting credit for good farming practices is going to be an opportunity, and it may pale today with some of the other things we've talked about because prices are high and all that. But you know, if if in three or four years from now we are back to just call it you know nine dollar beans and and four dollar corn, you know you're going to want that extra income stream. Uh, and and I think many of you are already doing these good things, just not getting paid for it. Um, the um, so the new food systems, I mean, Mary, you, talk, you talked about, I mean, all those trends are, are here. Consumers are changing their tastes to some extent. It's led by young people. That's not surprising. Um, but it is kind of interesting how this sort of plant-based protein meat alternative industry has, it almost feels like fallen apart. Uh, and, and I don't really think it has. I think it is it's going through a phase. <laughs> There'll be a 2.0 of this. Um, it probably needs to be rebranded in, 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 in some way. I, I, I don't think calling something in a, an alternative or, you know, I just, you know, call it a delicious new product, you know, because it can be. Uh, but it is pretty amazing how quickly this thing has, has kind of fallen apart. I think it's going to come back in a, in a pretty strong way. Uh, and I think a lot of it will be mostly uh, based on, on, on sustainability claims because it seems like that is what drives buying decisions as much as if it is good for you or not. Um, I think all the fermentation, precision fermentation you mentioned, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's all out there. Uh, it's, but it's pretty slow to gear up because the capacity to ferment doesn't exist. It all has to be built. That takes a long time, and it's not, and, and where do you build it? And who builds it? You know, it's not the new tech company is going to build that. Uh, you know, that's not what their investors want them to do. So who's going to build all this fermentation capacity? Trolling with people who already have it is not going to be easy. That's like asking Bungie to give you a toll crush for soybeans. That's probably not an easy discussion to have at the moment. Um, I think cell-based meat, um, yeah, the 3030 program in Singapore, that's for real. And, and, and that's moving, but I think it's, it's 10, 15 years away before it really has enough of an impact to make a dent in what we do. But it's something to be, something to be watching for sure. Um, so all these trends are, are there. Uh, they're bubbling a little bit under the surface now because so many other things are more important and, you know, uh, take the headlines. But they're still there, and you just have to find a way to keep, keep yourself informed. I'm sure that Carter will talk about food is health. 
And uh, yes, <laughs> uh, and and I think that is a super important discussion. But I'm I am a little baffled by how, with the level of awareness that we have around health, what's good for you, or not what's good, not good for you, etc. I mean, the, the the awareness is 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 out there. There's so much literature. People are talking about it in the news all the time. And yet, the the only sort of substantial thing that has happened that I can tell over the last 10, 12 years is that. We've taken trans fatty acids out of most food products, so that's hydrogenated soybean oil, and we've reduced the amount of, you know, refined sugar in some products. But other than that, you know, I, not not much has changed yet, despite all this. So I I don't know what it will take to ignite that transformation. Maybe it's just time. Maybe it's younger people growing a little older and making the household decisions, and you know, not us. Uh, so it could just be time, uh, but it would be nice if there was a catalyst. Self-selection process if you eat unhealthy. <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> but we've been doing that for a long time. So anyways, um, the, uh, that, that's really all I had to say. Um, you know, a, a bit of a hodgepodge of everything. No, I appreciate it, Soren. I, as always, uh, love hearing Soren's perspective. And we get on a few calls from time to time, so I sp appreciate uh, yep. you, you, you providing me with that uh, intel. Carter? You want, to, you want to rattle or? Yeah, I, I, everyone take out a piece of paper and you're, I ask you to write something down, and a few things in a moment, and I just got to recount a story. When I started at McDonnell Douglas in our early 90s, I, we decided we wanted to kill Saddam Hussein with a bunker buster, and we had to build it and design it. Nobody had it, and we spent three months doing it. We took a battleship cannon from Waterville Elite Arsenal in Troy, New York, which had been rusting, turned it down and turned it into a 32,000-pound bomb that we dropped off of an F-15 as a dive bomb. He wasn't home when we dropped it, but we deployed it in about four months. Developing technology is actually not that hard. I, I ended my career at Boeing working for the CTO, managing a $2.5 billion investment, annual investment strategy and I would say there wasn't much technology we didn't succeed in developing. The challenge is getting it adopted. And so we've been here since 2015. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just realized sitting in this room that, you know, I worked for the CTO of Boeing directly, sort of helping them figure out where to invest and what technology to adopt for about five years. And I just dawned on me that I select as your CTO. The farmers in this room have problems. Uh, we can forecast different things for you. But in our role at iSelect, you know, we've invested $200 million since we started coming here. Many of our investors are in this room. We've taken one company public, Benson Hill, have others coming along. And we're here to help you do your job better. and. Our job is to take all the information and give you the most objective viewpoint. And so I ask you to do a couple things that I'm going to cover in this conversation here. Uh, first is to write down my phone number, 314-517-7555. Um, and whenever you want to, if you're seeing Debbie Borgs in the room, she does this to me all the time, um, you know, she sees something in the market, has a question, text me. I, I, don't call me. It's just too hard. But text me because I get so many spam calls. I just don't know what the. <laughs> feel free to text me at any time. You're saying a new idea, Carter, or some what? new technology they see out in the field, or something they want you to. Look Anything, at. You're seeing a problem. You're like, I can't figure out what's happening with this carbon stuff. I can't figure out what to do about biologics, and I will do my best to make sure someone on our team or our companies. We've got 65 portfolio companies will connect you. The other I would suggest is. There's a lot coming down in AI. We've just done three videos on this. Go to the YouTube channel for iSelect. Subscribe to it and watch the last few videos that we did right around Christmas time on GPT. And then the third thing is go to the iStore or the Play Store and download the iSelect app. Now, this is a beta app. It's going to be live at the end of the year, at the, at the end of the month. It's ugly. Andy has been beating up on me about it, um, but but what we're doing with this app is we've integrated in GPT, which is the newest, coolest AI stuff that we talk about in the videos. 
Um, download the app. We've integrated. We've integrated it for nine months. We're working with Microsoft on this. We've been using this technology. Everybody knows it as may be heard about recently. We've been using it for nine months. We're turning that into a tool that improves access tech technology. And so I select's role with this app and with these other things. And I, I'll give you my number again, just because you may have missed it. 314-517-7525. Our job is to give you access to technology and access to investment and access to opportunity. Um, the app, in a sense, is going to turn into sort of access by iSelect. And that is, how do I figure out what I'm supposed to be doing and listen through things? So that's what we're going to do. So now iSelect does two things. Thing one is uh, focused on food is health. Thing two is provide access to opportunity investment technology. On thing one, we spend $1.7 trillion on food. We spend $1.9 trillion on the healthcare costs related to poor nutrition, U.S. alone, $9 trillion globally. $1.9 trillion is being spent each year by doctors to do rust and repair on people who've got diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and such. So food is health. If we fix nutrition, we fix health. So what does that mean? You have all been in the nutrition business. You're also in the ethanol business. Or we're going to talk a little bit less about ethanol, but it relates. Um, as we think about nutrition, we see that there's a $1.9 trillion annual opportunity for you to take market share from healthcare. You'll spend more in the last couple of years in your healthcare than you did in your entire lifetime. But that's, a, that's accumulated uh, issue of your years of not eating necessarily right. So what do we mean by nutrition? We mean make protein cheaper than sugar. Benson Hill's doing that. Maybe they're not quite there, but they're reducing the cost. So if we can make that cheaper, then people have access to affordable quality nutrition. It means focus on omega-3s out of corn instead of omega-6s. Omega-6s kill you, omega-3. So it doesn't mean stop making corn or it doesn't mean stop animals. Look at the nutritional quality. So you've all been focused on yield for years. To us, improving nutrition is not to say you're doing anything wrong. It's to say that now we understand that our nutrition and our diet needs to contain more protein, needs to contain more omega-3s, and while the rest of the world's run around telling you to stop using nitrogen and you know, thinking that they've got some brilliant insight, is take on the challenge of doctors, actually, it's, this is ridiculous. It's amazing how little doctors know about nutrition. So sorry, stop listening to them. And start thinking and listening more to the idea that the macronutrients around protein and the micronutrients around like things like omega-3 um, are the kinds of things that we need to start optimizing to. And so instead of selling, what may be happening down the road is instead of selling by how many bushels, you'll be selling by how much omega-3 you're producing. I think Matt will talk about that in terms of how much protein you're producing. That's a challenge because we're sort of in a refinery model. The soybeans are like partially used for food and partially used for diesel, and it's not quite sure which is the excess product in that market, depending on all these other influences. But I would say from a technology standpoint, thinking long term, think long term. You know, these things will sort of work out. I can't, as again, a conversation I had with some farmers this morning is like, what do we do about interest rates? I don't know what to do about interest rates. Um, it's going to be tough. And they're, they're with sort of a pain in the ass thing that we have to deal with. But long term, $1.9 trillion per year in food is health is a huge market. Does anybody know how big the cell phone market is globally? $480 billion. The global market for food is health, $9 trillion. And if you're, you're feeding things that kill your customers earlier, then you have less customers. Um, <laughs> And it's not, uh, it's, again, it's not your fault. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to think differently about it and get educated about it. You know, talk to folks like Travis Potter. I mean, he is on fire with the statistics about this stuff and just fascinating. Um, we 
through Kevin's pushing and Andy's pushing and other people's pushing, and we're not doing it right. Uh, we live on feedback. I've got two ears, one mouth. Um, so we're I select, we'll listen, and we can't always do everything, but we are your chief technology officer. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but this room of people has given us insight that have made us effective investors, and then you're benefiting as customers of it. Adoption, what it takes to adopt technology, is a hundred times harder than it takes to create. Um, and I will say, I spent two and a half billion dollars a year sp building technology. So I need your feedback. If you want better technology, we need your feedback. Feel free to text me for now. The app will have some capability to be able to do this in a more organized way. My phone number is uh, 314-517-7525. You running for office down there? <laughs> Listen to him. Go. Um, Eva's here back. We've got Booth back here. Eva... Uh, leads our marketing team and our community team and can sort of help you figure some things out if some things are challenging. So the last thing, do you want me to announce what we're doing? Or no. do you want me to shut up? Yeah, shut up. That's good. Okay. <laughs> good thing we're friends. Now, anyway, we've been busting Carter's ass a little bit, Andy a and little I. Bit. We're, listen to him a little bit. So we're all invested. You want, in we go to dinner. I like paying for dinner, partially. Yeah, yeah he was. He shit He's kicked out of me at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first night. But we're trying to get, we want iSelect to come out with an app that, so they've seen four to five, 6,000 deals come across the plate. And we love being a part of it because we can see what's coming early in the space, right? They invest money in early ag tech startups. So I want to be able to see what's coming down the pipe that gives me an advantage to relay to you guys and our own operations and things I'm invested in gives me an inside advantage. I want Carter to put it on an app like rally or collectible or some other app that's out there where we can just flick through and see the new businesses as they're coming online, you know, and we just flick through, Oh, let's invest five grand in that one. Oh, well, I don't like that one, but maybe I want to use that one on the farm. Or maybe I want to call to buy the product. I'm not sure I want to invest in it. But I want to be able to see what the companies are and just their, their input. And what, what happened originally, to let everyone know in the, in the audience, Andy would get millions of crazy harebrained <laughs> people coming to him wanting to use his money to do, you know, to do a business. Well, and he'd tell me about it, shit. We'd throw money at it. He'd throw money. He had things where... We meet Carter, and Carter's like, my goodness, guys. Like, Andy McCray's like, I could keep you guys out of a lot of problems if you let our team look at the business models and properly look. You know, Andy and I just have drinks with people and fire off. and Oh, yeah, that's a great guy. Let's invest. So <laughs> we thought, hey, this is going to be great. We got Carter, his whole team. They can really analyze businesses, dig deeper in. And keep us from investing in stupid stuff, which we still do invest in stupid stuff, but it has helped. And Carter's team provides just awesome, you know, research and information that we could all use. And I would just love to have all of us have better access to seeing what's new coming down the pipe. Like early, early with Benson Hill or early with yeah. whatever it may be, Geltor, the other companies that are going to be big uh, just because it gives you an advantage to see like you're saying car like you get an so advantage the, to just one point of sensitivity the apps in beta by the 24th we're going to have the final out and we're going to you you've asked for the ability for all these people to be able to invest just like you yeah. are through iSelect and we're going to provide that capability so that you also can invest that'll be on the 24th around the 24th when we formally release yeah he showed us the app last night. Now. We told him it looked horrible. So if you see it, don't, you know, <laughs> give him a little break on it. He, they're trying. <laughs> they're moving the right direction. Let's, uh, Matt. Yes, sir. Mr. Chris, my friend Matthew. What uh, I think Soren and Carter kind of teed it up there for you on, uh, you know, where things are going on the seed side and the food side. I know you guys have a lot in the hopper. Uh, a lot of us are invested. And, you know, kind of tell us what uh, what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, well, I'd say, um, you know, Soren's comment hits it right on the head. Uh, we produce a commodity product today, and I think tomorrow a way for the U.S. farmer to differentiate is to produce a premium product. And high oil is a, a concept. Uh, high protein is one that we've brought to life and that we're taking to market. 
low anti-nutrients, uh, which is good for certain target markets, uh, high oleic, low linolenic soy oil, another quality trait that some of you are familiar with, um, and even stacking those together. So we, we even uh, work with some of our farmer partners, many of whom are here, uh, on, on dual premium value streams where you have a high oleic oil stacked with, let's say, a high, high protein, low anti-nutrient uh, uh, meal or what can turn into white flake or a flour or a concentrate. And, and, and we're taking a bean that has got the breeding behind it and the technology behind it to create more value downstream beyond the farm gate. And that's really the role that Benson Hill is playing, is saying, how do I take a terrific amount of value for a, a large variety of end markets, by the way, and move that back to the farm and, and allow the farmer to participate in a way that the commodity system really doesn't doesn't allow today. And uh, I want to I do want to clarify there's there's some semantics that some of us hear and it triggers for instance we hear plant-based protein and then some people myself included think automatically a uh, plant-based alternative like a plant-based chicken nugget or plant-based burger. What I'd really like to help everybody appreciate is when we say plant-based protein, remember that that's a market that's a thousand times larger than plant-based alternatives. Plant-based alternatives, interesting space. Some can say uh, huge potential, you know, but extremely still niche. And, and to Mary's point, it's bumping around. There's some areas of adoption. I think that the model's going through uh, a relaxation off of what was a hype cycle that we probably saw over the last couple, three years. Um, so that's an area of, of interest, but that's, that's a, a minuscule amount of where Benson Hill moves high protein uh, beans uh, into. Now, one case study, because it actually plays off of some of the commentary also made from a carbon perspective, is, uh, is the aquaculture market. I gave an example to some folks about this yesterday, so I apologize if it's redundant. But when you take a bean and you produce protein at a high enough level where you don't have to go concentrate it further to supply, and in this case, the Norwegian salmon market, where, by the way, half of the world's salmon is produced, you can actually create a product that disintermediates that entire processing step. And that might not sound like a big deal, but the reason why it is a big deal is because that concentration step is the most energy-intensive, water-intensive step in the entire supply chain. So when you have folks in the EU, where, by the way, carbon is over $100 a ton, uh, and who are being told not just by their customers, but also by the government that they need to adopt more sustainable methods in their supply chain, and you say, you know, Mr. Uh, salmon producer, uh, rather than buy Brazilian non-GMO concentrate, why don't you buy U.S. grown high, uh, I'm sorry, a high protein, low anti-nutrient meal from Benson Hill, which behaves like a concentrate, but oh, by the way, it has 89% less carbon footprint and 70% less water usage. It becomes a no-brainer. And I can sell it to that guy for the same price or a better price than he's buying the other product because that, that concentration step also just happens to be the most expensive part of that entire supply chain. So we're doing this right now, and some of you in the room are growing product to do that. I only give that as a case study. There's 14 sub-markets within the plant-based uh, protein category within human food. Uh, we've obviously got oil, which is moving into CPGs, grocery, uh, food service. These are all opportunities to help the U.S. farmer differentiate their production and for us to figure out a way, as we're doing now in practice at scale, to bring value back to the farm, more profitability per acre. Uh, so we have crushed plants in Iowa and Indiana. We're vertically integrated. We signed a massive partnership with ADM last year, uh, and we work uh, in Illinois around their Decatur plant. Uh, so we're contracting acres. Many of you, I hope, have seen the booth outside. We're open for business. We're growing at an extraordinary rate. Two years, three years ago, 30,000 acres. Two years ago, 70,000 acres. Last year, over 100,000 acres of contracted production. And this year, our goal is to double that. 
So we are growing at a rate where there's a terrific amount of opportunity. There's a lot of uh, genetic varieties, you know, spanning from the one twos all the way down to the four fours, uh, you know, so the right in the heart of, of, of a lot of where you all sit. And um, you know, we're eager to have a conversation with you if you're interested in, in where we think the food system is headed. Perfect. And many of you know, we were early investors in Benson and many of us in the room have thousands of shares. So Matt, Matt, I knew he was going to ask me this question. Matt, three million. Matt, you there, <laughs> Matt? Anyone home? A few million. Let's, uh, Kirk's let's got talk a few uh, three. Shares. Three. Yeah, Matt's got a few. Million. Every day I get a report of insider buying. Right, a CEO buys, a CFO buys of whatever. Well, a few weeks ago maybe, or wasn't that long ago, I see Matt Chris pop on my screen buying shares, and I'm like, interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, so for those, I, you know, yeah. let's, let's talk, Matt, what are we doing here? What's going to happen yeah, here with no, this no, no, stock? No. I, I, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you, and I don't mind sharing it here, that it's frustrating to see uh, a team of people at Benson Hill executing better than any team I've ever worked with in my life. We're the only company that has gone public in the last two years that I know of, and especially those of DSPACT, um, and raised the financial guidance three times in 18 months. Uh, we have hit and beat virtually every number on the P&L, uh, and we've now reported six quarters of results. Um, so I'm really proud to say that we are, the business is running as well or better than we expected. Um, we are focused hardcore on execution, on delivering on our promises, on continuing to serve our farmer partners and our customers, uh, which, frankly, I believe we're doing an exceptional job of. Uh, but there is a there is an overhang from, I think, going uh, public via DSPAC in the back half of 2021. And, uh, you know, I looked you know, yesterday in one of my uh, annual rundowns, newsletters, I got the DSPAC index was down 69% for sure. in, in, uh, in 2022. And, um, you know, like I said, the stock price has not performed at a level that uh, I'm, I'm happy with. But you know, we really are keeping our heads down, executing, delivering on our promises. And to your point, um, when the when the window first window became open, you know the CFO, our CFO, and I got the email open window. You bought, bought because I, I have a high conviction that the the stock is uh, one thing. We just from and we did ask. You know, I I mean, our our belief is, yeah, there's been a witch hunt on anything that went out as a spac. They've just annihilated it the short side sellers and that's probably was the play early on now with interest rates popping to where they are the next witch hunt is they think many startups are going to be out of money the runway is going to be short and they're going to squeeze the hell out of them so they've been having massive short side pressure on wall street we believe hopefully that they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater in some aspects and we see it as a buying opportunity i had dinner with matt tuesday I bought more shares on Wednesday, so I was buying, and we were down at around 250. So, if you know, and I think we popped a little bit, but you know, I've been buying. Um, I think long-term story is awesome. I remember trading Amazon early, early at the CBOE uh, when it came, and we seen similar. It's similar. I mean. You never hockey sticked early. I mean, it broke and you had pressure. Google broke, had pressure. I mean, you know, it just is part of it. I think long term, I love Matt and love him as a friend. And, and, and you know, I think as a great CEO business leader, I think he does a great job building a great team. And that's what it takes to be a good CEO. You look at the personalities of Soren, uh, Matt, a lot different than myself as a leader. I probably would not be a good CEO. It's... <laughs> It's just, it takes a different mentality. It takes a different approach. And I, I commend both of them. I think you guys have built, built great teams and you got uh, a lot of people that, that, that love to work with you and be part of your uh, mission. So Thank I'm you. happy to be in it still, Matt. I'm sticking yeah. with you. So I, I'm I appreciate your more support. on trade. Just keep putting more on. I'm just going to keep one, putting more one, on, Matt. One little thing in, dis in markets like this where you've got these disruptions is, and we know all the analysts and we love the analysts who are covering this and we know many of the investors, the people in this room know more about this business model than anybody on Wall Street. You're better informed about the risks and opportunity in this business model than they are. So make your decisions that way. 
Um, and, and, and also look to diversify, just like Tyson was the main investor in Impossible or Beyond. I mean, they were hedging, you know, they were hedging it off. If you're not going to adopt the technology on your farm, I would suggest you have some type of investment strategy where you can invest in it. Uh, you know, same Soren, right? You guys did the, did the same at Bungie, did the same, uh, people do the same at ADM. So, um, you know, I, I would pay close attention and invest in it, even if you're not going to maybe particularly use it. So that's my thought anyway. Johnny, let's move down Johnny Hunter real quick. Uh, Johnny's a good friend uh, of ours. He's from down in, uh, in the southern part of Missouri and kind of transformed his farm. I wanted him and Travis up here because they've taken products from their farm. You guys have heard Travis before. Travis will tell you about his next new venture here coming up. But uh, Johnny is doing the same, trying to, like Mary said, build a premium product off the farm. Uh, people are willing to pay a little bit more for. And Johnny, kind of tell us your, your, your what you got going on. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, the 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 title of this talk is the the future of of food and farming, and you know, I don't know if we've necessarily even talked about that. <laughs> talked about a lot of things up here. Um, I, you know, when, when when you hear Johnny talk to the group today, when when I'm talking to you, you know, I, I'm really talking to the farmers. Yeah, that's what I am. Um, I don't know much about banking. I don't know much about private equity, venture capitalism. I'm a college dropout. If you don't believe me, ask Jason Mayer. He's sitting right back there. He was with me. He watched it happen. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I know <clears throat> as, as, a, as a producer, you know, I'm, I'm third generation on my operation. I lost my dad when I was 10 years old. And so I was, I was baptized in the waters of change. Change came to me whether I liked it or not, and it impacted our family farm in a way you couldn't imagine. It, it stopped. And so for 16 years, our family farm stopped. And that's a hell of a thing to go through at 10 years old. And so <clears throat> after I grew up, let me rephrase that, after I got older, <laughs> I realized that a huge uh, <clears throat> linchpin in, in a family farm is, is when dad dies, so, so does the farm. And, you know, a lot of retirement plans for farmers is, is an auction truck. And I didn't want that for my family. Um, what I wanted was... A, a real business. I wanted a real company. And I am a CEO. I don't know what the hell that means. It means I deal with all the bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Pretty much what it is. But that, that's what I wanted for my family. And so, again, <clears throat> I'm not a learning man, but I'm just smart enough to know that Bungie. ADM, ABCD, and R, Riceland. They want to pay me about 17 cents a pound for my rice. And they do not give a shit whether I'm no-till, cover crop, sustainable, not sustainable. They're starting to care a little bit now. <clears throat> they may give you another half a penny a pound. But I was just smart enough to know that if I took that same rice, I knocked the husk off of it, I put it in a bag, and I put it on a grocery store shelf, now that product all of a sudden is worth at retail $3.50 a pound. So I went from 17 cents a pound to $3.50. I don't need an MBA from Harvard to do that math. I can do that on the hood of a truck. Now, what they didn't tell me when I built my mill and when we created the brand is that you couldn't just do that and then the phone was just going to start ringing off the hook. And I kind of thought that's how it'd go. Great family story, sustainability, operations, no till, no flood, no burn, no fungicide, no insecticide, 
we use a cover crop on every acre. I've been the poster child of sustainability for about 10 years. They won't put my face on there, but they want to talk about me. That was a joke. But I, I tell you all this, I tell you all this for, for, for one reason. Whenever I, everybody here has spent a significant amount of money to be here, especially farmers. A dollar to a farmer is different. It's different. So you, you've taken your dollars and you've invested them into this, into this conference. And when I do that, I always try to make sure I'm carrying one thing out the door. And if you're going to carry one thing out the door, I'd like you to carry the fact that you can't go home and continue to, to be tomorrow who you are today and, th and think it's going to work. I'm really worried about the American farm. I'm really worried about the American farmer. I'm really worried about how we're going to buy land. And you need to be equally worried about if something happened to you tomorrow, where does that leave your family farm? Do you have a company? Or do you have a lifestyle? Most of you have a lifestyle. And you need a company. You need a process. Thank you. That was good, Johnny. That was nice. Um, Travis, kind of expand a little bit on that. Yeah, that was good, John. I think, I think most of you know Travis. He started uh, coming here back. Uh, we were dipping the, the, the uh, tractor out of the coolers. Remember you and all the kids, Travis? And he was dipping it out with Dixie cups. And I'm like, God oh, dang, Travis, this is going to be a tough road to hoe. And the next thing we know, you got it in all the Chipotles and in a lot of all the 7-Elevens and things have really launched and taken off and you're doing uh, some other new ventures but you got the kids all here and doing all kinds of crazy stuff so congrats Travis and appreciate you showing up kind of tell us what uh, where you see things headed and what you got going well first of all after these guys I feel like I shouldn't even be up here uh, I appreciate everybody being here and and uh, Kevin what you do for the world of ag is is tremendous uh, really appreciate that um, it's a uh, it's an honor, it's a blessing to be here. I'll give you guys a little bit of background. Um, I only have 11 children. Um, we have our eighth and ninth grandchild on the way. And yes, I'm 12, uh, so you do the math. Um, uh, we, we, uh, I, I grew up as a farmer rancher too, and, and uh, one day we went to the sales yard and I got, we, we sold a, a sheep to the, at the sale for eight bucks. Now, you had to sell for 10 bucks, uh, otherwise they kept the rest of the money. Uh, it, was, it was a rough day. Now. A couple of weeks before that, I was staying up all night trying to keep lambs alive, and uh, and I thought to myself, this is not going to last. And Four thousand acres, we can't afford to eat. And uh, and so that same day, I went to the, the grocery store, and uh, this is a very long time ago, at thirty some years ago, and uh, and it was twelve bucks a pound for lamb. I'm like, how is it? I sold a whole sheep for negative two dollars, and uh, and they're getting twelve bucks for a pound for that dang lamb in a, a Mexican market in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, how does that even work? And so I'm like, I got to figure that out. So like him, uh, 17 cents to 350, I'm like, there's a gap. And I got to figure out that gap. So in that, we tried a little bit of everything. Uh, the biggest thing I figured out like him is I couldn't go to a regular university. They would teach me how to raise the animal and sell it at, at the end product was always silos. So um, I went the old fashioned way. I, I had this old guy that uh, used to take, me, take me to school. I lived about 45 minutes from school. And uh, he had, he had this, this cane and had 80 brands on this cane. And he said, I worked for every one of those brands. I rode for every brand. And I said, uh, well, which one of them made any money? And he's like, you're going to figure, out, figure that out your, yourself. The only way to do that is to go work for them. So I went to work for ranches all over, sheared sheep for everybody, and, and uh, worked for cow outfits and hog outfits and whatever I could to try to figure it out. And then later on, went to a meat college and learned how to do everything meat-wise I could. Uh, so we're talking about alternative meats. Um, it's kind of funny because the stuff that makes alternative meats is the same stuff we used to put in with the meat to make it go longer. Now they call that flexitarian and they think it's hip. Um, I'm still trying to figure out who's, who's right. Um, but in that whole thing, we, we, we were the first guys to organic meat. 
and then got into our beef and then got into added value products and uh, then got into organic dairy. And during that time, a lot of, a lot of the whole process was, is it's a niche to make more money. But through that whole process, I lost my mother-in-law, I got to breast cancer and uh, I lost a lot of family members to different, different things. Both my grandpas had Parkinson's and, and I looked at it and I'm like, maybe it's the food. Maybe it's how we grow it. Uh, what can we do to fix that? And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying uh, most people whine about it, especially those 18 to 35 year olds still live with their parents, but they can make decisions to change our lives. Um, <laughs> it's uh, we got to come up with solutions. So in that, um, I thought, you know, one thing is to sell filet mignon for 35 bucks a pound at a farmer's market in San Francisco and, you know, be happy you sold 600 bucks worth of meat that day. Another thing is, is to affect a, a multi-trillion dollar industry. You know, how do you, how do you gap that? And that was, that was the big conversation is, is what, are, what are the big impact things we could do that changes the game? Now, all of, you, all of you are in here, none of you really want to change too much. But the reality was, is in 1890, most of you didn't have family members that raised corn or soy. Um, my, my grandpa would, would, would drive a horse with cattle from Texas to here to butcher them to go to New York City, and that wasn't very efficient protein. Uh, we've gotten to where we can make protein in a lab. I don't, I don't really think it, it tastes very good, and I don't, I don't even know if I can digest it, uh, but we've gotten a lot better at raising it. But as I, I've kind of gotten deeper and thought about what do we do for the world, um, and so in this, we went through the whole process of, well, first of all, how can, I, how can we get a product to, to the end user? And make some money out of it. We did that. So a tractor, first of all, a tractor I think is probably one of the most efficient tools of all times and, and sure made it so people don't have to work so much. Imagine how people can't even show up for a regular job now, how they work in the field. Like we needed a tractor. Um, but tractor beverage, uh, we, 10 years ago, I was on my kitchen table mixing up drinks, trying to figure out how to, how to, how to take waste fruit juice and turn it into something that people would actually buy. And it wasn't just to get rid of Coke and Pepsi. It was a uh, for all those water drinkers that were going in the restaurant. If you're in the restaurant industry and, and, uh, and you're, you're selling food and you don't sell any beverages, you're no longer in the restaurant industry. That, the, all the money's in the beverage. So in that, we could have gone to Whole Foods and, and you know, Trader Joe's and all the natural food stores and sold them drinks and been like the other 97.5% of beverage uh, companies that don't make it. Um, or we decided to go a different route. And so like, like he did, Going a different route's not easy. You get kicked in the, you know, what's a lot. Um, so you got to figure out what to do. But we went around them and figured out that there's a huge need in, in beverage, which is a massive opportunity also to get healthier stuff into people's bodies. Now, yes, we use sugar. We use a lot less sugar than most people. But it's still, it, it's still something we're working on and having less of. But we also have fruits and antioxidants and nutrients that are good for you in it. And now we are in thousands and thousands of locations. I, I, um, we built a team around the company, built it. Um, the other day they told me we sold 80 million drinks this past year, which uh, that's not a pat on my back. It's like, holy, cr these guys did it. I just made the drinks. Um, but I did the math. It was actually closer to 100 million. And I thought, that's a pretty big deal for, you know, there's 400 million people here. Maybe, maybe every one of them, you know, a quarter of them got to drink some. Or there's a lot of people just drinking a lot, you know, 10 or 15 drinks a day. I don't know how it works. But, uh, but as, as I knocked on a lot of doors, I've talked to every single, every place that you've eaten that's a fast food chain, I've talked to every single one of the people that have been there forever, that will never change, they usually get fired, and then they finally call us. Um, um, and I've knocked on their doors, and we've knocked on their doors to talk to them for the past 10 years saying, hey, we've got a better alternative than you, you giving a free cup, which costs you 20 cents, of water to somebody. Now, Chipotle jumped on the bandwagon with us a few years ago. And it's been pretty amazing. Now, I knocked on their door for a long time. I, and and they, they went through a lot of changes, good, bad, and ugly. They're finally into, into a really good place. But what I learned out of that deal was that uh, they don't know what, what you guys know. And they also don't know what's coming down the pipeline. What they do know is, is for sure they need to get healthier. They need to do better things so people like them. And then they need to actually move the needle. And they, they also need to not greenwash and, and say things that are probably not true about what they're growing. They, they, they legitimately, I could say this as a farmer, are doing the very best they can uh, to make it so you farmers can make more money and so that they can have more nutrition in their burrito. That takes time, effort, and energy. And they've tried some stuff. I don't know if you tried the first queso, but it sucked. Um, that's my personal opinion. But, uh, but drink-wise, they, they made me do 80 different versions of one drink to decide not to do it. 
Now that's a lot of work. It takes it. Oh, that's a lot of time over and over dealing with people flying all over. But the reality was, is when we figured it out, it did pretty well. And that's what it, that's what you basically have to keep on innovating. And and it could be as sim- something as simple as using some waste watermelon juice that turns into something that tastes good that people like that makes their burritos sell more. Um, in that whole process, though, they always come back to me for interesting and weird questions because uh, I'm like, you guys need organic drinks now. Now we're one of the b- largest buyers of organic sugar in the world. I feel like I'm. You know, kind of at fault with diabetes issues, but it's less than everybody else's, so I still feel good about it. Although I, I do need organic sugar. If anybody has some, raise your hand. Um, about 40 million pounds. Um, but anyways, in that, um, they have beef issues. They, they need an extra 150,000 head of cattle for their beef. Uh, so I'm helping them try to figure out beef. Uh, they're like, hey, we need more rice. Anybody has organic rice or conventional, they're, they need more of it. If they go from 3,000 locations to 6,000 locations, they're already the biggest rice buyer in the world. You can bet they need it. They need avocados. They need romaine lettuce. They need all kinds of things. Um, you, you, you got his phone number? Call him. He'll, he'll get a hold of me, and you guys can tell me what, what you need. I'm talking about Carter. I'm just kidding. Uh, you guys can email me at <coughs> travis at drinktractor.com if you ever want to yell at me or if you need, need to get a hold of me for any reason. But, uh, but in this whole process, you don't think about what a small chain like Chipotle might buy in consumer goods or uh, ingredients. $5 billion worth of food. A lot of chicken, uh, a lot of avocados, and then drinks. Uh, but you think about, they only have 52 ingredients, which of that, there's only like six of them that you guys produce. Um, that's it, there's a lot going on there, and they're looking for more farmers to help them. As, I, as we go down this road, kind of back to the organic side, as we did organic beef, and our, and our yields weren't as good, and we did organic dairy, and our yields weren't as good, and we had crops, and our yields weren't as good, the biggest conversation that most of you guys would say, well, why would I do that if I get 30% less? That means I'd have 30% more ground, right? Like, not necessarily. How does, how does this work? And so part of my quest is, uh, as a guy with 11 kids and a boatload of grandchildren on the way, is uh, you know, how do we feed the world more with better food with less chemicals? So as we've gone down this road, I've been contemplating you know, kind of the, the moves that I want to do that are bigger impact than than drinks or you know, raising or shearing a couple of sheep on my farm and get my butt kicked uh, on just on a day to day basis of you know this broke or that broke. But what is it? What can I do to affect in, fa- in fact or affect all of you uh, in a better way? And so we looked at you know, different botanicals and minerals and kind of this kind of the the snake oil dynamics of you know what what could you put on a crop to make it work? And it kept on coming back to like the number one biggest or there's two big things. One is you got to have water. Uh, so, I mean, having a tractor is pretty handy too. Uh, and then the third one is really nitrogen. And uh, as an organic farmer, you can't just buy nitrogen. Everybody's been complaining about it. I, th- I thought it was awesome. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. We always have been dealing with nitrogen issues. Now everybody's got to deal with them. And uh, during that time, about two and a half years ago, I met what I call Nitro Joe. I don't think he likes it very much, but uh, I, think he, I think he's pretty amazing. You guys will dig him. But uh, I met Nitro Joe, and he developed a machine that takes nitrogen from the air mixes it with a little bit of water, and makes fertilizer on the fly. And I thought, man, does that change the game? And I, I think about it from a commodity conventional perspective and organic. Like, from an organic perspective, now I don't have to pay a couple thousand bucks a ton for chicken manure, but instead I can just pump it out of, out, out of a, this little machine that comes out of the air, just kind of makes this mist thing. And I'm like, I don't know how it works, but it, it starts here with water, and then you test it, and it's got nitrogen in it, and you put it on a crop, and... I was blown away. I put on tomatoes, and, it, and I went up three times in nutrition. And the, the, the tomatoes I didn't put it on all died. And the ones I put, I put it on were bigger than I ever saw in my life. And I thought, this guy's on to something. So we partnered up with Joe, Nitro Joe. And with, the company's called Green Lightning. And, uh, and we thought, you know, if we want to change the world, one way would be if just adding more nitrogen would be kind of handy. And then at the same time, the whole world falls apart. We have a video where we have like 15 countries ready to ready to kill everybody because they can't get nitrogen. And I thought, we, got, we have a solution. We have a machine. Now, it's still tiny. We're, we're, we're building it bigger. Six months from now, it'll be a lot bigger, which is not in time for most of you for farming. But, um, but I thought, wouldn't it be handy if with the tractor and the well, now we have this other machine that all of you will have in the next five years on your farm, and your, your cost of nitrogen is going to be almost nothing. Uh, a little bit of electricity, which you can run solar panels or when wind generation by the way I, I put 90 solar panels on i was patting my back i thought it was pretty cool until we had three months of of snow and clouds and nothing 
So uh, it doesn't always work all the time. So don't take it fully off the grid. That's just a, one of those oopsies. Uh, <laughs> there's no way to be off the grid 100% if you live uh, almost to Canada, uh, unless, unless you're smarter than I am, I don't know. Um, but in that whole process, we're, we're trying to figure out what, what are these things that we can do to kind of move the needle. So the one was nitrogen. The other one was what if we can make our water more usable? What if we can not, uh, not get it all clogged up? By, so is there a water system that we can use that would do something? So we found uh, the Eco guys, and they've got this system that's unbelievable uh, that does that, it makes the water more usable and more functional. And you can, if you're using 30% less water, it's a whole lot less electricity and a whole lot less that you have to deal with. So then we got into the bigger conversation. I, I got in this bigger conversation with, with Chipotle. Uh, we went round and round a little bit on what's the future of protein look like? Um, and some people said, you know, can you do the plant-based? How does that work? And, the same time, Berg, or McDonald's came out and said, we're selling less than one plant burger uh, per store per day. Um, and it, unless you're going to buy more of them, we're no longer going to carry these. And all of a sudden, the plant-based communities, ah! And they're like, well, you were sneaking a regular burger when you were trying to sell a uh, plant-based burger. So um, in that, I think it comes back to same thing like with the organic and you know, no sugar. If we did no sugar with all of our drinks, we wouldn't sell any. I think it all comes back to just having the basic fundamentals, like 98% of the world is gonna eat the same stuff. We just need to tweak it a little bit to make it healthier. Like he was, he was saying, uh, can we have more omega-3s per acre? I think, I think we need to figure out, instead of bushels per acre, we need to figure out, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna guess here, but let's just say we have uh, 1,200 pounds of, of protein with 90% uh, TDN in it per acre instead, or higher omega-3s. Our omega-6 levels versus omega-3s are one of our reasons why we have a $350 billion heart disease bill a year. Uh, these are all things that we got we to gotta work on. And, that, and I'm, I agree with him. I think, I think people living to be like 118 is a, a way smarter uh, business model than people dying at 68. Um, I'd much rather sell to them for longer. It makes it, it makes it a lot better for all of us. So, but going into this kind of bigger conversation about uh, uh, what is the future of agriculture, like he was talking about, uh, it's, it's really just using... I, I was anti-technology before. I, I was kind of, I was hanging out with a bunch of Amish people and I thought they had it figured out until you, I realized they couldn't really scale. But I thought there's only so many people that work and I came back to like, there are some technologies that do make our lives better. I don't know if our phone does or not, but I'll tell you, it's a lot handier to pay a bill from our phone than it was to stand in line at the bank on a Friday afternoon and they close before you can even get in there. So we, there's some technologies that are better, uh, that are smarter, that we can use that are going to make us significantly more efficient. Matt's got some technologies that he's working on that'll make us so that we can grow more food and more. And, and we, we talk about nutrition. You guys are really energy and nutrition farmers. That's what you do. You produce protein, you produce fat, you produce sugar, and you produce energy. There's not really a whole lot of extra in that. I mean, there's, you can get down to the micronutrients and all that, but the reality is, is if you look at it from a big perspective, you know, how much do we need? How much do we eat? If we tweak this a little bit, how can we get it so that people are healthier and, and we can make more money off of it? It's going to come back to, this goes back to the innovation part. The innovative farmer that does do things that are different, I'm talking about the 2% of you that will actually come out and talk to us. Um, you're the ones that are going, everybody else is going to watch, sit back for a little bit, and the next year, the rest of you are going to jump on board when it works for them, or five years from now, depending on how the s curve works. It, worked, it was like that with, with Chipotle, with us. It took 10 years to get to a point where, where everybody wants to talk to us now. And every one of your, every one of your towns are, are going to carry our products, which is amazing. Going backwards a little bit. We're going to have to take a break, Trev. You Sorry. I, th I think we're already 15 over. I know everyone wants to hear Travis, and he can definitely keep on rolling. But <laughs> let's take a 15-minute break. I have Granger Smith coming up next. Then we'll break again for lunch. Thanks, the panel, for being up here. Thank Talk you to all. them when you have questions. Appreciate it. Thank you.